neuroscientist and author, Dr. Sam Wang. Thanks very much. Today I want to talk to you about willpower. Now, willpower provides a critical counterweight to creativity. Uh, we're here today to celebrate creativity and to talk about creativity, but without willpower, creativity uh, runs without the engine that drives it forward. So now in everyday experience, we know what willpower is. We, um, we exercise willpower when we say no to dessert. We exercise willpower when we resist an impulse to say something aggressive or to say something inappropriate. Uh, we also exercise willpower when we um, build a family or when we build a company or uh, something that's very important to us when we build a career. All these things are capacities that we all know about from everyday life and we call willpower. So what I want to do today is talk to you about it from a scientific perspective. Now, I'm a neuroscientist, and so what I want to do today is talk to you about willpower as a capacity that's generated by an organ of your body, and that organ is your brain. And what I want, hope to do today is to illustrate with some examples from uh, psychological and also some neuroscience literature uh, to get across to you this feeling that willpower is a capacity that's generated in the brain. And in particular, I want to talk to you about it as a finite resource and also something that you can build in your muscle. The way that you would build a muscle uh, elsewhere in your body, willpower is a capacity that can be built and strengthened in your own brain. And so that's my subject today. Now, I'm going to start from a place that we all know about. It's our own everyday experience, of our own conscious experience, and things that we believe to be true about our brains. As it turns out, we all have beliefs about how our brains work, even though we may not be aware of it. And I'll just give you examples of uh, beliefs that we hold about our own brains. Um, it is believed that when you play music, classical music, to a baby, or even a fetus, that child would become smarter. It is believed that when you drink alcohol, you kill brain cells. It is believed that when you play Sudoku or engage in brain training software, you're doing something to keep your brain, as you get older, from losing it. Okay? So these are all examples of beliefs that many of us have about our brains. All of these beliefs are false. Okay? and I'd be glad to talk to you about it afterwards. <laughs> and I'm gonna take a wild guess about which one you're interested in. Okay, but, um, but all of these are myths, and I'm gonna use these icons here to illustrate to you uh, which things are myths, which things are um, uh, updated. As I said, I'm gonna cite psychology and neuroscience literature, and I'm hoping to replace uh, some myths with research-based facts, and so I'm gonna be showing this little icon here. And uh, as you can tell from the subject matter, it's not a recondite academic subject. I'm trying to get across to you something that perhaps is a little bit useful in your own lives and also in the lives of people close to you. And so I'm hoping to eventually head in the arc of the talk towards uh, useful tips that you can use in your own lives and in the lives of people close to you. Now let's just start with, uh, with a nice, fat, juicy target. Um, and it's a myth that, I'll, uh, that some of you may already know about. But I want to start with a statement that goes back over 100 years ago. This man's name is William James. And William James is a foundational figure in psychology and also in neuroscience. Uh, he uh, gave motivational talks and scientific talks. He did a lot of outreach to the general public to talk about what was known about their minds in terms of uh, what at the time was the leading edge field of studying the mind, and that was psychology. And he specifically, when he gave public lectures, said, we are making use of only a small part of our possible mental and physical resources. And he said that in 1908. Okay, so that was a perfectly true statement. But it turns out that that statement got turned into something else, and it got turned into, you only use 10% of your brain. Okay? And this, is, this conversion occurred at the hands of this man, Dale Carnegie. Dale Carnegie <coughs> won book sales and influenced readers by saying that you only use 10% of your brain. And so this is an interesting case of a belief that uh, if you trace it back, the farthest back you can trace it is to this motivational speaker and not to the scientist who said something that kind of resembled it. And so this is just to give you an example of the kinds of beliefs that we have about our own conscious experience, about our daily experience, and that these beliefs often get superseded. And the reason that this one in particular is not true, I'll debunk this one for you, is in fact you need your entire brain, okay? Now, I, <laughs> and, Maybe you're, you know, I'm hoping that some, I think many of you are scientifically savvy, and so maybe you're not very surprised uh, to learn this fact. But uh, just to give you a sense of the brain as a biological organ, I just want to tell you some basic facts about it. So the brain weighs about 1.2 kilograms, about 3 pounds. Uh, that's out of a body weight, a typical body weight of 70 kilograms. And it's a biological organ, as I said. It's an organ like other organs of your body. And it's furthermore a very efficient organ. In fact, it uses 12 to 15 watts of power, the way that you would measure power in an electric uh, 
clients. And that's out of your body's total energy budget of 70 watts. And so in fact, uh, it uses a fair fraction of your body's energy, but that's about as much energy as you would find, say, in an idling laptop or perhaps this light inside this refrigerator. That would be a fairly typical power consumption. So in some very literal sense, we're all dim bulbs. <laughs> and, but, there, but there's an important lesson here, which is that even though we're very energetically efficient, we're also, in some sense, running flat out. And the, what I mean by that is that we used 15 watts of power to power our brains. But it turns out it's a finite resource, OK? So evolution has shaped the, ener the brain to be uh, energetically efficient, to do a good job, to help us survive and thrive in life, but also has uh, trimmed things down to the, uh, to the minimum so that, as a result, we're only able to, um, in, a, in other words, the brain is a finite resource. And so, in fact, it's possible to deplete aspects of the brain's resources. And I'll show you what I mean in the context of willpower. So now we're going to turn to the subject that I uh, wanted to talk about. All right? So now, willpower. As I said, uh, we know what we mean by willpower. I'll give you a technical definition. Willpower means um, effortful self-control. And what that means is, for instance, if I give you something difficult to do, like standing at attention or sitting in a room for hours listening to people, no matter how much you may enjoy yourself, uh, these are examples where you have to exercise some amount of willpower to resist the impulse to just get up and walk around, that kind of thing. And so those are examples of willpower. Now, it turns out that willpower is a thing that's been studied in the laboratory by psychologists and also, uh, to a certain extent, by neuroscientists in the last few years. And I'll give you an example. So if I give you an impossible puzzle to solve, you will spend a certain amount of time on it before you give up. And there was a study done, a pioneering study done by the psychologist Roy Baumeister and his collaborators in which before giving this impossible puzzle, he gave people radishes to eat. Now, it turns out that the subjects were students. And on average, students don't like radishes. And so they had to exert a certain amount of self-control to, to eat the radishes and also to do the puzzle. And it turns out that after noshing on the radishes for a while, they were only able to keep it up with the impossible puzzle for about eight minutes. OK, and that was all they were able to do. Now, if they were not given the radishes to eat beforehand, they were able to persist at the impossible puzzle for over twice as long. Okay? So it turns out that there's something going on here. The thing that's going on here is that there's a common mental resource. And that common mental resource allowed these students to do this impossible puzzle or to attempt it, and also to eat the radishes. And when they did one, it appears that the other one ran out. Now, it turns out that there is um, another control that was done here. You need a control group when you do a scientific study. And um, these students were in the presence of another group of students. And the other group of students were given freshly baked chocolate chip cookies to eat. And these students spent plenty of time on the puzzle. They just did it and did it and did it. OK, and so they were willing to do it. And it was a little bit mean because, of course, these were freshly baked cookies. And so you could smell the cookies. And you're doing the puzzle. And you're doing this hard puzzle. And you're eating these radishes. And, and, you know, and it's, it's a sort of a mean um, experiment, really. <laughs> Now, it turns out that this experiment has been done um, without the chocolate chip cookies. It's been done in other means. And so it's been done without the cookies, so it's just a radishes versus nothing. Um, it's also been done uh, in a form that goes like this. You're given a page of text, and your job is to circle the letter E over and over and over again. Just circle all the instances of the letter E on the text. Um, and then your next job is to watch a very boring video of a wall and a table. Okay, in which nothing ever happens. It's just a wall and a table, nothing ever happens. Now, okay, now you might ask the question, well, if it's a really boring video in which nothing ever happens, why make it a video? Can't you just show an image of a, but anyway, the experiment was done of a video of a wall and table. And it turns out that circling the letter E over and over again reduces the amount of time that people have to spend on, uh, uh, on, this, uh, on this second task of just watching the boring video. Okay, so now I want to turn just a little bit to the neuroscience about why this is that this is true. Uh, what we now know is that um, the brain has specializations. And so in fact, as I said, you need your entire brain. And it turns out that each one of these brain structures has a very specific role that uh, it has to play in our everyday lives. And so um, it turns out that, um, that willpower of the type that I've talked about uh, requires something that's called executive attention. And what I mean by executive attention is uh, capacities like the following, to make plans, to act on those plans to have working memory, to hold information long enough to really focus on a task, to not allow yourself to be deterred from one task by a distraction, that kind of thing. So these are the, the kinds of capacities that go into something that's called executive attention. And it turns out that the executive attention has been um, 
imaged in functional MRI, and also uh, executive attention is deficient in people who have had brain damage to particular parts of their brains. And this is one major reason why we know that we need 100% of our brains, because if any part of the brain is damaged, then you can tell what uh, you can you, you get a particular symptom. And so, in fact, executive attention requires several brain regions. One is the prefrontal cortex, which is up here in front. And another is the anterior cingulate uh, cortex, which is sort of down here. It's kind of buried, so it's not labeled here because it's a little bit hard to see. But the general idea is that brain functions require these specific uh, brain regions. And these particular capacities, executive attention, seem to require the prefrontal cortex and the anterior cingulate cortex. OK, so now. An obvious question is when we deplete our willpower, when we get tired of circling the E's or eating the radishes or whatever it is, what is it in the brain that runs out? Now, it turns out that what, it, what that is is not known. This is a subject of active research. People don't know what it is that runs out. Um, one possibility is that it's blood sugar. It turns out when you do a tedious task, your blood sugar goes down. It also turns out that your prefrontal cortex is particularly demanding of, of sugar, and so as a result, uh, depleting blood sugar seems to deplete one's uh, stored willpower. In fact, in that radish to uh, impossible puzzle task, if subjects, uh, if the students who took that task were given a glass of lemonade, a gl mm, lemonade, a glass of lemonade containing sugar, uh, that boosted their performance on the second part, so they suffered no decrement in the performance from the first part of the task to the second part of the task. And if they drank diet lemonade, it, did, it didn't do that. Okay. And so one possibility is simply blood sugar. Now, another possibility is that perhaps some neurotransmitter runs out. So for instance, uh, something that is rate limiting, something that's required to maintain your effortful self-control. And that's another possibility. So this is an area of active research, but people don't know exactly what it is. But the main point is, from, our, uh, from the standpoint of one's everyday life, is that it's a finite resource. So for instance, uh, let's say that you're headed for an important job interview or an important meeting. Maybe it's a good idea not to go window shopping beforehand, because you're going to have to exercise self-control before you go to that, um, that important meeting. Or maybe if you're trying to, you know, uh, I don't know, stick with the diet, maybe you should not, uh, I don't know what, uh, try, to make, uh, try to wrestle a two-year-old or something like that while you're on the diet. I mean, that's a hard one to avoid. But, uh, but the general idea is that if you, ha uh, if you have something important to do, you should be careful not to deplete your willpower beforehand. Uh, and, you know, conversely, if you're going to an important meeting, maybe you can let that housework slide for a day or so and just, you know, go ahead and just concentrate on your meeting. Okay. So now there's a converse to the idea that willpower is a finite resource. And the converse is that the brain is a plastic organ. Okay. So it's like a muscle. It can be built up. And you can change your um, brain by uh, experience, by things that happen to you. And in fact, the brain's willpower mechanisms are expanded by practice. And because these very different seeming tasks, eating radishes, solving a puzzle, uh, watching a boring video, because they seem to use common brain regions, what that means is that unexpectedly, if you have to exercise your willpower by doing one difficult task uh, that's uh, tedious and so on, it builds your capacity to do a complete un unrelated task. And in fact, the tedious task that you practice um, doesn't have to be a very important task. You can do things like brush your teeth with the wrong hand. Okay? So in fact, it's been demonstrated that if you brush your teeth with the wrong hand for weeks, this improves your ability to stick with the diet. <laughs> it's true. This has been studied. Okay? Uh, if you brush your teeth with the wrong hand for a period of weeks, you can also um, resist junk food better. You can, uh, you can curb your aggressive impulses better. All of these things rely on the same mental resource because they rely on the same brain regions. And so something as simple and silly-seeming as uh, if you're right-handed, brushing your teeth with the left hand is going to help you out. And if you're left-handed, you, know, you, you know what to do. All right. So, and this is illustrated just here in this uh, diagram. This is, a, this is a, a, not a diagram. I'm used to giving technical talks, and so this is actually not a very technical drawing. But this beautiful, uh, fanciful uh, cartoon draw, uh, drawn by Lisa Haney, who's uh, uh, a cellist and also in the same, uh, at one point, the same cello group as Zoe Keating, but in her other life, she is a very accomplished um, illustrator and she loves cognitive science. And this is a picture of a neuron, and this neuron is in fact lifting weights. And the concept here is that you can change your brain by altering what you do with your brain. Okay, so that's the general idea. Now, I want to take this back a little bit. I know we've been talking about creativity in adults, but what I also want to talk, to, talk about now is childhood. Okay, and now what I'd like to talk about is the idea that you can also exercise willpower and, you can, uh, and this can be done at an early age. We've heard about behavioral problems that kids have in school. Uh, it's all the rage to talk about things like attention deficit disorder. We worry about kids who have that problem. 
uh, a standard approach to this kind of thing is Ritalin. Okay. But it turns out that there's some recent findings that this willpower training that I've been telling you about also works in children. It also works in preschool children. And in particular, I want to give you this idea about children's brains. Children's brains are always changing throughout life. And what I'd like to, uh, if, let's go ahead and show the movie here. And this is a reconstruction now of child brain development, starting from childhood, going through adolescence. And what we're looking at here is a, uh, is a reconstruction based on looking at many brains, and we're going to have it on an infinite, uh, on a loop, a finite loop. And what's going on here when we look at this diagram, this is some nice reconstruction work from uh, Paul Thompson and collaborators. And what we're looking at here is brains developing. This is the cerebral cortex. OK, and so the general idea here is that the brain develops from back to front, and over a period of years, uh, blue indicates mature, and red indicates not yet mature. And what happens over a period of years, it achieves its final um, thickness and uh, mature volume uh, fairly late, early adulthood, really. And that's interesting, right? Because I just got done telling you that uh, prefrontal cortex is a necessary component for effortful self-control. And in fact, it's not even done until one's 20s. And that maybe tells you something about adolescence and the kind of difficulties adolescents face. Okay. But another lesson is that the brain is a changeable organ. In particular, there's been some very exciting work that's been done recently by uh, Adele Diamond and many other researchers. Adele Diamond is at the University of British Columbia. And the idea is that you can train self-control in preschoolers. And in particular, what you can see is that when you take preschoolers and engage them in imaginative play, you can engage them in things where they have to make a plan for their play and then execute that plan throughout the day. This idea allows these kids to do better in school with reading and self-restraint, that kind of thing. And what it's called for is basically guided play in which you get the kids to pay attention and exercise self-control. And they can build up their willpower. And it turns out there's been some exciting evidence that this persists throughout life. It turns out that self-control is a more powerful predictor of uh, academic accomplishment and of what these kids' peers think of them than IQ. Okay, so self-control is a more salient predictor of measures of success that we have than, uh, than intelligence tests. So that's interesting. I want to end by taking this back to neuroscience. Um, my co-author on Welcome to Your Brain, Sandra Amet, has uh, been interviewed on the subject of dieting. And she got interviewed, and she talked about these willpower training things that I've been telling you about. Um, and it turned out that the editor came back and said, well, could you not use the word willpower? Because it seems like kind of a dirty word. We don't really want to talk about willpower. It kind of implies that people are weak. OK, so what I want to leave you with is the idea that research has now demonstrated that the brain is a plastic organ that experience can change the brain. And when we take it down to the level of cellular phenomena, this is a single neuron, now this is a real neuron. When you take it down to cellular phenomena, it turns out that all these different levels of function are linked to one another. And I've just given you the very top level because it's the level that affects our everyday life. But right now, neuroscientists and psychologists around the world are working on the idea of understanding how activity and experience can change the brain. And everything I've told you about is something that happens at the level of nerve cells and connections between those nerve cells. So take that home. Thanks.